makes it memorable. Makes it memorable. Why would he say 959? Well, now I'm not going to forget 959. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome tonight. Um, we are going to finish up um, our sort of exploration of the what we call the membership vows in the United Methodist Church. This uh, kind of parallels um, what I've been talking about on Sunday mornings about why church matters um, and what it means to be a part of the church. I want to say I didn't want to I didn't want to steal um, the. I didn't want to take the spotlight away from where it needed to be tonight. I know you all um, received a letter from me this week about some changes. I'm going to talk about that on Sunday morning. Um, so, so just if you're, I'm not like pretending like I didn't drop that bomb. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> but tonight was about the graduates, and that's where it, where it needed to be. So. Um, and, and I'll, I'll address the congregation about um, my change on Sunday. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we are talking about why the church matters. And then that's on Sunday mornings. And here on Wednesday night, we've been talking about our membership vows or the, the membership vows that we take when we become a member of the United Methodist Church. Um, and those five vows are prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. If you've been a member of the United Methodist Church or, or the same United Methodist Church for more than 10 years, you only vowed uh, to, sub <laughs> yeah, to support the church by your prayers, presence, gifts, and service. Witness was added just 10 years ago. Um, so just kind of a neat little piece of trivia. But tonight, that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, last week, we spent some time on our gifts talk, and thinking about our spiritual gifts, talking about giving from our financial resources. Tonight, we're going to talk about putting those gifts to practice in service and also in, in witness. I'm not going to be talking much tonight. I'm going to show two, two of these videos. I, I, like the, um, um, I like the kind of personal testimonies that are part of that and personal experience of... of um, being in service, being in witness, giving, all of those kinds of things. But at first, I want to start tonight. I know we were having a little trouble, and it was time-consuming to take that spiritual gifts inventory and to fill out the key last week. Did, I'm just curious, did anybody go home and, and learn a little bit more, or did you know everything when you left? <laughs> yeah. What? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Tell, share it, CS. <laughs> Yeah. One of the ones that came up high on CS's list was pastor. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's a role that's, you know, a function that we play. And that this is why some people have these gifts. And it's not necessarily only um, something that comes with ordination. And, and it has to do with... You know, pastoring comes from basically shepherding sheep, right? Um, so watching out for the flock, essentially. Um, yeah, that's number five. That was like number five on mine. I had a three-way tie for first, and then second, third. Maybe it was fourth. Maybe pastoring was fourth. But really, when you take that three-way tie, it'd be like sixth or something. <laughs> I don't know at what point you're like, this doesn't count anymore. <laughs> um, any other... Any, anybody else learn something new after we left last week? We talked some about, about this. Some of you all shared, finished up and shared. Um, but um, I just wanted to see if anybody went home and learned a little bit more. Yeah. So it reinforced what, you, what you're doing already. Yeah. Was anybody surprised, I'm just curious, when you looked at your results, was anybody surprised? I think CS might have been a little bit surprised. <laughs> was anybody else? Mine, mine was pretty much uh, what I expected. I wasn't really surprised by mine. And, and yeah, it's like, well, yeah, I guess 
if these are my gifts, that would explain why these are also my strengths or what I'm good at. <laughs> um, so, okay. <clears throat> so, um, so the thing about gifts, and, and this is here not for tonight, um, but for uh, Sunday, there's a, there's a puzzle up here. I mean, y'all are probably wondering that what it is. But the thing about gifts is every one of us has different gifts or a different combination of gifts. And what Jesus tells us about the body of Christ is that each of us, eh, really this is more Paul's thing, but, but each of us has a part to play in the body of Christ, and it's different. So, so our gifts, Paul kind of compares it to the parts of the body, right? He says, you can't be all feet. You can't be all eyes. You have to have a hand. You have to have, you know, some, some eyes to see and ears to hear. And, and every part matters. And if you miss any one part, something's not going to function quite right, right? So when we talk about sharing our gifts and serving, in order to, for the body of Christ and the people who follow Christ to, to do that well and to its fullest, everybody has to contribute and to share their gifts to serve in the kingdom. And so that's, um, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, service that is serving but also um, witnessing. So when you say that you are supporting your church with your service, what does that mean? <laughs> work for the church. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the very literal, right? You're going to work for the church. This weekend when they paint the office in there, somebody's going to be in there painting, serving with their paintbrush. Being a willing participant. Yeah, so not only that you're there and doing it, but it's also a willing, yeah, not just showing up. Yeah, that, I think that's a good point, Sally, that it's, this isn't something we are, um, but like we, we do it to check a box or because we feel like we have to, because, but because this is like something that just, it's, it comes naturally as an outpouring of, of Christ's own service for us. Yeah. What else? What does it mean to support the church with our service? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. I was hoping somebody say that. <laughs> yeah. That we are, and, and this really also goes into the witnessing part, right? That beyond the four walls, we are serving in Christ's name. So it's not only that we are serving the church specifically, but the greater body of Christ and God's kingdom more generally. Um, definitely. So, so it's, it's being here, it's um, being, willing, being here willingly, but it's also being out serving in Christ's name. So both things. So what, ways are, what are some ways y'all are already serving? I know you are. So just, and don't be shy. What are, what are ways you're already serving? Giving and teaching. Yep. Choir. Handbells. What? Committees. Committees. <laughs> Way to put a damper on that one. I was thinking dance team, Steve. <laughs> What else? Bereavement meals, very important. Yeah, yeah. Not that any of these aren't important, but yeah. Thank you. I'll, what? Greeter. Yep. You you are also and and Paula's not here, but you know and others at the food pantry every other Tuesday and and then another group on Wednesday. That's a form of service. In that case, this is more kingdom service. Uh, others, other ways you're serving? We've heard a lot. Yeah, the congregational care team, we call them here. Yep, yeah, who, who make regular contact with our folks who are, are shut in or, or um, somehow other, otherwise unable to, to be present 
think we talked about this a few weeks ago, um, but keeping them connected, that is definitely a form of service. What? Yeah, mission, mission projects in town or, or trips that go into the region or, or around the world even. Yeah, there's lots and lots and lots of ways that, that we can serve. Um, you know, the Chad walked in to the gym tonight and I was like, anybody talk to you? <laughs> Which nobody had. And I was like, we're gonna need two mics and the computer coming through the sound system tonight. Can you take care of that? And so he grabbed the iPad and took care of it. That's service. Um, there's so many things that happen. Um, so many ways that, that we can serve. And doing that kind of thing, um, you know, here on Sunday mornings down in the gym, um, Joe and, and Chad make sure that the, the service gets out, you know, onto the internet so that people who can't get here can watch that. Very important. Again, um, so, so it doesn't seem like much to press a button on a computer key, but if they didn't do that, that'd be 20 to 30 people that are disconnected. Um, so so every, every gift matters and making use of that matters. I want to read a um, passage from Acts chapter 6, the first eight verses. Um, if you happen to want to follow along, it says this. About that time, while the number of disciples continued to increase, a complaint arose. Greek-speaking disciples accused the Aramaic-speaking disciples because their widows were being overlooked in the daily food service. The twelve called a meeting and all the disciple, of all the disciples and said, It isn't right for us to set aside proclamation of God's word in order to serve tables. Brothers and sisters, carefully choose seven well-respected men from among you. They must be well-respected and endowed by the Spirit with exceptional wisdom. We will put them in charge of this concern. As for us, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the service of proclaiming the word. This proposal pleased the entire community. They selected Stephen, a man endowed by the Holy Spirit with exceptional faith, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parm Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. The community presented these seven to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. God's word continued to grow. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased significantly. Even a large group of priests embraced the faith. Stephen, I'm going to read one more verse. Stephen, who stood out among the believers for the way God's grace was at work in his life and for his exceptional endowment with divine power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. So thinking about that, there's a lot happening there. What are some of the forms of service that you heard kind of raised up in that or saw through their actions, lived out? Prayer. Prayer. They did a little committee work, y'all, didn't they? They called the disciples together and appointed a task force, <laughs> right? What else happened? <laughs> yeah, daily food distribution to um, the widows. And, and they appointed a group to do that so that something else could happen. Do you remember what that other thing was? Proclamation of the word. They tied those two things together. Um, so, so service both of, of physical need, right? Feeding, nourishing the body, but also nourishment through uh, the word. Was there anything else? Yes. Yeah. 
yeah, that's right. Once they had identified those seven who would work on this, uh, yeah, they called them together and they prayed over them and they laid hands on them. Um, that's what I was just looking. Well, okay, so what, it, what verse 8 says is that Stephen um, was doing great wonders and signs. So, so it doesn't say, this one doesn't talk about speaking in tongues, but about wonders and signs that he, that he did. So, um, yeah, so lots of things happening there, right? And, and if you think about it, we can also draw some parallels to things that happen in our churches today, right? And what does it say happens when they do that? The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased significantly. Even a large group of priests embraced the faith. So when we serve, um, when we give ourselves in service, we are um, connecting people with Christ. Um, whether that's that we are connecting one another and growing greater in our faith towards Christ, or if it means we're reaching new people and, and they are encountering Christ in new ways. Service makes that possible. So as we think about service, I'm going to show this uh, video. So give me a minute to get back here and get it started. come to chapter 5. So we've moved our way through uh, prayers, presence, gifts, and now we are at service. You have to put into service what you're learning in order for this to really become active in your life. So just talk a little bit about the importance of service and how it plays out in this course for us. I think part of uh, the concern that is underneath this is that while the church always talks about serving, there are large numbers of people who have never found their way mm -hmm. that they can actually serve. That one, because they aren't encouraged or they haven't discovered their spiritual gift or on the church's side, that the church hasn't helped them discover those gifts and find a way to use their gift. I mean, every church can use another tenor for the choir and another Sunday school teacher for the seventh grade. But what if those are not things that I have any interest or desire in doing? Where, where can I fit in? So our, our hope on this study is that it will help each individual disciple to discover that God has gifted him or her in a unique way to be a part of God's transformation of this world and help them find the way that they can use that gift in a joyful and positive way. I think that's right on. Uh, the vow of service in the Methodist tradition begins with this notion that we're all called, we're all gifted, and we're all needed in the body of Christ. In the body of Christ, there's a role for everyone, and we have to help people discover what their giftedness is so that they can go out and participate. You know, one of the things that comes to mind when I hear you all talk and, and as we're working through the sequence is that part of the intimidation, part of the confusion, part of what appears to be passive relationship, maybe because we actually don't know our place. When you find that niche, your sweet spot, there's joy in that, fulfillment. We've seen that happen in people's lives and it's an amazing thing that they discover that they never thought what they did was important. I believe that this chapter will help people discern how God has wired them up so that they can serve others. Because hmm. that's really an important part of being a follower of Jesus, is centering our life on a life of service and then finding those ways to serve, being a servant rather than a volunteer. Because I think there's a subtle difference and we talk about it in the chapter. I think a lot of folks, when we talk this way, they immediately think of 
teaching Sunday school or serving on a committee. It doesn't have to be inside the walls of the church. If your gifting and your passion and your calling is to uh, help migrant students, I'm thinking of a guy that I've worked with in Lakeland, help students of migrant farm families get through high school and help them find scholarships. We as a church are here to support you in exercising that gift. So there's a liberating sense when we start looking at serving that is based on the gifts the people bring, not on what the church needs for me to do. Well, that's a, that's a flip. Mm -hmm. That turns it upside down. Because I think there probably are lots of people who, who do believe, like you're just saying, that really what service is about is yeah. I, I gotta find something to do at the church. Yeah, right. I gotta go down and volunteer for the church mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, I've always had a heart for helping kids who don't have English as a second language move forward in their education. Mm -hmm. When people discover their spiritual gift, like we're about to hear in Mandy's witness about how it changed her life, when, when people discover their spiritual gift and they look at the world and it breaks their heart and those things line up, God's love is made real and it's a beautiful thing to experience. Mm -hmm. When we remember that the way that Jesus served others, it's almost like a gravitational pull for us to model it and to live it. And this chapter will help you take your next step in that. Uh, you mentioned Mandy. That's Mandy Kloniger. Correct. Uh, uh, who, who has some very unique gifts and, and clearly is a woman of service. I mean, I, yes. I, that is so evident. I mean, her heart, you know, sunshine comes out of her heart. <laughs> She's a, a remarkable woman that I think people are gonna really, really be interested in and respond to. My name is Mandy Kloninger and I serve as the Executive Director for Trinity Cafe, which is a charitable restaurant here in Tampa with two locations. And we restore dignity while serving our nutritious meal to our hungry and homeless neighbors. I had been away from church community for quite some time and I had gone through a really painful divorce and I was really craving connection and community and some way to move forward with forgiveness. I knew I needed something, I just didn't know what I needed. And so I was really open to the process that a disciple's path laid out in front of us, where we learned about our gifts, we learned about our prayers, our presence, our gifts and our service, and even how to give. And as Justin shared with you, I mean, I made my first tithe in that class, and I'd never tithed in my entire life. So I'd gone to lots of professional development kind of training and knew about what my gifts were, but I'd never explored my gifts in the context of Christian community either. And so for me, I remember from taking my first quiz about the gifts that I had that could benefit my church community, that they were apostleship. And so for me, when I saw apostleship, I was like, well, maybe that's why I feel like I should, you know, be connecting one-on-one -on -one with people and I could explore other cultures and embrace what I felt like was a calling to travel and explore some things. And so for me, it was like an aha moment. The gifts that I already had inherently could benefit the Christian community I was in as well as my professional community. And I'd never done that before. I knew by the end of that class that I really felt called to explore missions and to do something in our mission community. I didn't really expect to change my career path. I didn't expect to be called on a daily basis to go deeper with people who are struggling in poverty and hunger and homelessness. I didn't expect my heart to like feel so malleable when I came home from Guatemala, but because I was open to that experience and open to the practices that I'd been taught all through Disciples Path, to pray, to listen, to see where God was calling me to go. I, I was open to that and I had to let God keep using that broken heart that I had seen in Guatemala for a very basic need around water to do something in my own backyard. But I also found healing through service of my broken heart. That's where the key for me has always been. It's, it's recognizing that if I can get out of my own way and do something for someone else, there's a blessing in that, but God will use that and He will transform me, He will transform those we come in contact with. 
and he will help bring us all into closer community if we're open to that experience. I think being really open to the process of letting the class and your community within the church help uncover and encourage your gifts is a beautiful thing to have happen. Not everyone has the same experience. They may start and recognize that, you know, this isn't for me, this, this piece, but be open to God's experience and try different things with your gifts and see where God leads you. We're given opportunities all the time to say yes to the, the things that God puts in front of us. Yes, I'll serve here and I'll try something new. Yes, I'll go outside of my comfort zone. I would just say, live into that experience. Learn what your gifts are, see where you might use them and give it a shot, try it out. And then be willing to let your heart change in that process and transform. One of my hopes for this chapter is that in finding each person's unique place, the same joy that Mandy expressed in the way she found her place to serve might be found by the person whose calling is to count the offering on Monday morning or put labels on a, mail, on a newsletter. It isn't the size of the serving that matters. What matters is that it's the thing that moves my heart and that uses my gifts. What we hope everyone experiences in this study is that they will take their next step to serve. But what we know is that you are gifted and you are called and you can look out in the world and you can look in the church and figure out your place to help make God's love real. Yeah, that's great. It, it, it does remind me of, there are probably things that I've missed. You know, just I, I walked past them or whatever and this chapter feels like it's gonna help, help us see that moment differently, take advantage of that service, take advantage of what is happening in my heart when I see things in the community that need help. So thank you all for that. Great chapter. Okay, so any new insights or ahas or, oh, that was really nice, uh, thinking about service? I'll just take that as I did a great job talking about it before the video. Um, let's shift to witness for a minute. Um, when you all hear witness, what, what do you think of? What does that mean? Yeah, okay, sharing part of your life with someone or your experience. Other ideas? Testifying. Testifying. Yeah, so kind of a courtroom kind of idea. Yeah, conveying something that you have seen, yeah, or heard. Yep. Other, any other thoughts? I'm going to read now from earlier in the Acts, uh, the first chapter, the first eight verses, um, and to listen to what this says or shows about witness. Theophilus, the first scroll I wrote concerned everything Jesus did and taught from the beginning, right up to the day when he was taken up into heaven. Before he was taken up, working in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus instructed the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed them that he was alive with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, speaking to them about God's kingdom. While they were eating together, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. He said, this is what you heard from me. John baptized with water, but in only a few days you will baptize with the Holy Spirit. As a result, those who had gathered together asked Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Jesus replied, it isn't for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. 
Rather, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So what does it say about witness? What does it mean to be a witness when at the end um, Luke records uh, that you will be the witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all the earth? What does he just describe to them about what they need to be doing? What? Share? Yeah, share his teachings. And then, you know, there was, a, there was a point in there, right, where Luke was making a point, right? Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and Acts. Just, that's why I keep saying Luke. So, so where Luke records that in the 40 days from his resurrection to his ascension, Jesus did what? Showed them many convincing proofs, I think is the word that, that they used. Me, uh, yeah. Many convincing proofs. So he was showing them, right, back to this idea of a witness as somebody who testifies to what they have seen. Luke makes it clear that these people have seen Jesus himself in many convincing proofs to show that this person who had led and taught them and been crucified on a cross had also been raised from the dead. And now they were to go do what? witness, testify to what they have seen. Yeah. So, yes, also to do miracles of their own. Right. And I don't know if Luke says that specifically, but we should know and understand that from the gospel, right? You know, what does Jesus do when he comes down from the mountain of transfiguration? He gets down there and the disciples are like, well, Jesus, there's this guy, he's really sick and we didn't know what to do. And Jesus said, you know what to do. I gave you authority to heal in my name. Right? So, so, yeah, not only that we witness to what we have seen, but we also have faith that, that Christ has given us authority to act on his behalf as well. And we do that, I think, then that to some degree goes back to how we serve and those kinds of things. Um, okay, anything else on witness that you hear or see in that, um, in that passage? Yeah, definitely. Right. Yeah. You will be my witnesses in Judea. Right? So th this is the other thing. It's not just among your friends. Right? You're here, and then you're out there in the Gentile world, and then you're going everywhere. Right? So, so yeah, it's up to us to... I was talking with um, somebody last week um, who, um, he, he was my innovation professor in, in my MBA program, and he's doing a lot of neuroscience work right now. There's something about, we, from, from our individual selves to our extended family, every person had eventually fans out to 80,000 connections. 80,000 connections we can make from ourselves through our extended family alone. Now, think about when, you know, I get with Sonny or CS and their extended families, right? We've just gone to, I don't know, I don't do that permutation stuff, but <laughs> millions of people, right? Just from the three of us. Okay, so, so, yeah, if we don't do something, we're really missing out. And we have a responsibility to do that, to keep things going. Um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show the video on witness, and then we'll talk just a little bit more before we finish up. It's a good thing there's no choir tonight. I'm going over. <laughs>
we've covered our prayers and our presence and our gifts and our service, and now we are to our witness. Uh, and you all have called it invitational evangelism. So we have witness and evangelism. And I usually say that evangelism is a good word that has a bad reputation. But the root of the word evangelism is simply good news. Mm -hmm. And evangel is a bearer of good news. The gospel is good news. So there ought to be something good <laughs> and joyful and life-giving about uh, seeing ourselves as, quote, evangelists. The way that the chapter invites people into it is look at what is the good news? What is that message that Jesus um, proclaimed and lived and invited others to? What is that? And we think disciples of Jesus and the discipleship pathway is a part of knowing that and living that and inviting others on the journey. And that's what this chapter is all about. You know, it feels like it's, it's more the law of attraction than the power of persuasion. Well, I learned from some of the attorneys in our congregation, I, I learned the, wit the role of the witness mm -hmm. in the courtroom, that the, the witness is not required to argue the case. Mm -hmm. That's the job of the attorneys. The witness is not called to decide for anybody else. The jury makes the decision. The witness is not about the business of judging anybody. There's a judge for that. The witness is only allowed to do one thing, and that's to say, this is what I saw, this is what I heard, this is what I experienced. And that's all the witnesses in the book of Acts did. They said, this is what we saw, this is what we experienced. I think we're also living in a time when personal experience has a tremendous amount of power and authority that people hear what another person shares and tends to respect that as, as a person's own word. So it becomes attractional, yeah, more than persuasive. Larry, who we're going to meet in this uh, presentation, is just my favorite story of that. Mm -hmm. The elements of his story are the way in which I see people genuinely receiving a witness, being sensitive to another person at the right time, then discovering their own way, and then becoming a witness themselves. But we want to invite people to think about who were the people that helped shape you, that walked uh, alongside of you, that helped share the story, both in word and deed, uh, to what the good news is. And then from there, how do we share it? What's our style? How do we invite others along the journey to this good news about Jesus Christ, who he was, who he is? You all are providing us with a framework, as you call it, in this disciple's path to help us make those decisions, to help us have a, a, another compass, if you will, uh, for our lives. And I, I think that's great. You mentioned Larry. That interview with Larry is, uh, is wonderful in the sense that we have another great very personal and revelatory witness uh, from somebody, I guess, who in some ways didn't expect it in his life, but needed it nonetheless. And now is living it, which makes it all the more beautiful. Absolutely. My name is Larry Ingram. I'm an attorney here in Tampa, Florida. So I lived a lot of my adult life kind of looking at God and Jesus from afar, looking at the church very skeptically, being a thinking, smart person, you know, it just didn't make sense to me, some of the things that seemed manipulative. Later in my adult life, I started feeling an attraction to religion, God, and particularly to Jesus, but I didn't have any way to find my way there. I realize now, of course, this is the grace of God speaking to me at this time, drawing me to, to a point. And then uh, at one point, I started working with uh, a young lady, a young attorney who moved to Tampa and joined my law firm. She was incredibly dedicated to her practice and, and her profession. Her, her father was a judge and, you know, very, very good attorney. I remember there was one particular instance 
where there was a project that had to be done. I, I went to her and it was maybe four or five in the afternoon. And like, we've got to get this project done. And she told me, well, I, I can't be here to finish this project. I can come back later. I can finish it before I leave, but I've got something important to do tonight. I believe I asked a question of, well, what could be more important than this? She said, this is when my Bible study group meets. And I made a mental note, check mark. I thought, that's interesting. In June of 2010, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer. That's one of those moments in your life when it clarifies everything immediately in some ways. And this, of course, at the top of my list was, I can't, I can't wait any longer. This tugging that I felt in my heart by the divine, I need to make the connection. So when that happened, uh, I went to my coworker and I asked her, what should I do? Something like that. What should I do? Tell me what to do. But she didn't tell me what to do. She told me, let me set up a meeting uh, with Jim Harnish. I was, I was the worker in the field. I was the one that showed up after dark. It was because I was afraid of being criticized for living my life, for all about me, my career. And then late in life when I have a health problem, then I show up and say, hey, I'm ready now. It was an eye opener for me to realize I wasn't going to be criticized for that. Jesus talked about that. He said, you'll get, you showed up late, you'll get paid the same as everybody else. They've been out in the hot sun all day, but it's okay, I'm here. And I can't tell you how wonderful it was that first day I walked into church and the stained glass and the sun coming in on the Sunday morning and people singing the hymns. And it was just, it was just a wonderful experience. It's like, I'm home. Effective evangelism for me was someone living the life and walking the walk, not in a showy manner, not seeking you know, attention, not being holier than thou. It stands out. You see it. You can't help but see it. So then I went to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota in November 2010, and they did some pretty radical surgery. And then I did some chemo after that. And by last year sometime, my oncologist said, you are officially a survivor which means your five years of being cancer-free. The worst thing that happened in my life was the best thing. Here we are, it's chapter six. We're through chapter six. We're at the end of, uh, of this experience. We potentially are a, a new set of evangelists. In the beginning of my journey and hearing that word evangelism brought some anxiety to me. And I think the beauty in this chapter is it invites you to wrestle with the story and talk about it and wrestle with it, even write about it, and then talk about how it's been made real in your own life and then give you a way to share it with others. You don't have to be an eloquent preacher to share the good news. You can live it by your life. You're an expert on your story, and that's what you will be able to share. Well, I can't help but remember Robert Frost uh, two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Our hope is that as we come to the end of this six-week journey together, that you've begun to travel a different path, that this path of discipleship is the road that you've taken. Using these spiritual practices, disciplines that you've learned, and discovering the difference that it will make because you've chosen to follow the way of discipleship. The journey doesn't stop, it continues. And it's a journey of love. Our hope is that people will continue to engage in community and that their lives will be changed and others will see it and they'll respond. And that community will be built and that the ripples of love will continue on long after we're gone. Okay, they gave one way uh, to be good witnesses. What was it? Or to work on your witness, or to be more comfortable with it. Anybody catch that? Tell a story. You live it, yeah. Yeah, that's what Larry talked about for sure, right? That, that 
when he was diagnosed with cancer and he went to his, well, for one thing, his, his colleague had already at one point said, I'm stepping away from this project for a minute to go to Bible study. And then when he was diagnosed with cancer, back from her and she said, let me set up a meeting for you. She took action. Yeah, live it. And then they talked about telling a story or writing a story, right? Y'all, if, if I've learned anything in, in preaching is stories are what stick, right? I can give you facts all day um, or, or, you know, lecture style knowledge or whatever, but what makes it click when you get it or when you remember it or whatever, there's a story that illustrates that. So when we are witnesses, what we are doing in essence, we're not really telling Jesus' story, right? We're telling our story of how Jesus has affected our lives with the idea, not even necessarily with the idea because it's just a great story, right? But, but what happens in that then is through our story, people see Jesus, right? Okay, so um, real quick, how could we live out our membership vow of witness? Talk. <laughs> know your story. Share your truth. Live it out. Right? Yeah, all of these things. All of these things. So prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. That is what we promise about how we will live our faith and practice our faith when we become members um, of of a local church, but, but what I want to leave you all with is it is by each of us doing those things that all of us are able to grow as Christ's disciples. We, we do this together, um, and that's sort of what we'll be talking about on Sunday. Um, as we close with a word of prayer, obviously, um, we want to be in prayer for um, the families in Texas in that community also um, Tina and Sue and Nancy who are traveling um, and Ed who is still recovering here um, and in the hospital he did move to a step down unit uh, today so he's out of out of ICU and improving um, are there other prayer requests that you all are aware of All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Almighty God, we come before you this evening. We come with all of ourselves, which is in some ways um, both beautiful and, and sacred and, and in other ways very dirty and messy. But we come to this place because you have changed our lives. And the people that are here and, and the people that have been a part of our faith journey have showed us what it means to be loved and transformed by you. And God, we look all around us in the world and there's so much mess. There's so much pain and hurt. There's so much need for, for hope, for change, for transformation, for life. Especially tonight we are um, aware of, of an entire community that is facing the, the loss of young children and their teachers. But it's not just that community, God. There's, there's hurt for other reasons in other places. And so I pray that where we are, the people that are around us might see and experience your light through us in some way as each of us seeks to serve you and to serve one another through our prayers and our presence and our gifts 
and our service and our witness. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I am turning.